position with CCG, um, although not his activity with us, I know. And um, that's the Vice President of Education. That's in, they're involved, obviously, in bringing issues um, to your awareness, educating our group. We have a Vice President of Activism and Events. Kathy Bessler is back there at the table in the blue jacket. Um, and that individual works in those areas to let you know what you can do to keep you updated on events. And then we have a Vice President of Publicity and Communication. Jean Bolger is in that position at this moment. She is not with us tonight, but um, the pers that person obviously involved in publicity. And we have a Secretary and a Treasurer. And um, we would very much appreciate anybody who is interested in trying to be more involved and um, maybe introducing some new ideas, uh, getting some new, you know, activism going with us. We would really uh, welcome you to join us on the board, so please feel free to nominate yourself. Uh, does anybody, can anybody, uh, could you raise your hand if you are a voting member? In other words, you signed our mission statement and would like a nomination form. And then one of our members, one of our officers will, Kathy, you bring those around. Anybody, anybody else, put your hand up, she'll bring those around. And we'll collect them at the, uh, towards the end of the, the meeting and announce who's been nominated. Okay, um, we are always looking for volunteers. If we were just given quite a, an allotment of wonderful conservative books. We had a library at one time, but then, uh, kind of lost our librarian, so if anybody's interested in, in um, setting up a lending library for us, that would be a ter terrific service to the group, I think. So let me know if you're interested. Uh, we also have volunteer forms. If you did not get a chance to fill one of those out, um, there's lots of different ways we need help, and you can find something that you specifically uh, would enjoy doing, and we would appreciate that so much. I believe you're on the back table. We have a couple of uh, outreach committees or uh, groups of people that said they were interested in outreach. So um, I'm just going to list a few names here because I'd like these folks to meet after the meeting. If you can come up here to the corner. Outreach to churches, uh, the Souders, Sarah Crook, Kathy Powell, and Jim Archieri. If any of you are here, you can meet up here. And Vicki West is also involved with that. Uh, we also want to start planning outreach to the cities, to the um, minority groups that that uh, we need to get our message to. And if Kathy Powell, John Lesniewski, or Brad Hindrick-Leiter are here, if they could meet up here after the meeting. You've seen on your seats the upcoming events handout. There's a lot of terrific um, opportunities coming up, so uh, please take a look at that. Does anybody need an events handout? Did anybody? sit in the chair that doesn't have one, if you want to put your hand up. Kathy, do we have more of those? There's an extra one up here. The oh, events handout. There's plenty of events uh, sheets. Back okay, there. at the back. That's great. Is there anything that, Kathy, is there anything you want to point out real quick about the upcoming events, or just let them take a look at it? Uh, take a look. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I will say just one thing about them. Um, oh, let's see. One of, one of the events is uh, is upcoming like almost immediately. Of uh, course, it's the first, well, there's the concern going on. This, uh, 14th through 16th is the CPAC down in Washington, D.C. If you're interested in that and all, you need to uh, get on it and go to the, the website. Uh, and the other, do, 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 number five is for the marriage rally that's going to be the 26th of March. There is information on here um, as, as far as uh, there's a couple buses going, one's from Lancaster, one's from down the Shrine of uh, Chester. Oh, yes. Exactly. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, put, I printed out a couple of forms back there on the table, like 15 of them, because there's registration on that. And so I just, if anybody's interested in going on that, you know, you can pick up one of the forms back here. Okay. Great. Um, and there is carpooling. Did, did Kathy just say that? We, we can organize carpooling. carpooling. Yeah, yeah if you want to contact Kathy contact for the marriage march. So, all right, great. 
Um, as far as CCG goes, I'm going to announce this now because I know some folks leave early. April 9th, second Tuesday in April, will be our next meeting. I'm very excited about this meeting because I still have five children in public schools and uh, a number that have graduated, but five still in the schools. And our topic is going to be indoctrination in education. I am reaching out to Peg Luxick. I uh, haven't confirmed that yet, but I'm hoping to have her there. If you don't know who she is, you might want to Google her. Tremendous um, patriot advocate for, for um, correct education in our schools. Yes, and that's right. Support Sam Rohr for sure. Um, we are also inviting the school board members. Some folks have asked about the primary coming up. I believe the primary is May 21st. This primary is uh, basically county and local. So at the county level, we have um, several row officers. None of them are challenged on the Republican side. I'm not sure about the Democratic side, except for prothonotary. And in April, we will have uh, the two candidates for prothonotary here. Um, also, the, a lot of communities have school board um, elections coming up. And because we're talking about indoctrination education, we thought we would draw the school board candidates um, with an offer to you know, get up and identify themselves and say a word or two to their constituents, possible constituents, as well as, as hear a great um, educational forum on education. So I do need some help with um, just reaching out to these school board members and doing a little bit of research into indoctrination education. If you are interested in that, please, please let me know that today. And in May, we're going to be doing the topic of the threat of Islamification. Um, we're working on the possibility of getting Brigitte Gabriel, although um, I've got to have support from other Tea Party groups to do that, and that's been not forthcoming as quickly as I thought. So, but we can find excellent speakers on that, and we look forward to doing that. Okay, just a couple of quick uh, legislation updates before we move on to our speakers um, that we are looking forward to tonight. One thing that you may have heard about on the news um, that particularly uh, touched my heart is this lawsuit by none other than Eric Holder against this German homeschooling family. How many of you heard about this? Okay, a German homeschooling family uh, fled Germany to the United States seeking political asylum because in Germany homeschooling is against the law and they uh, jail the parents and take the children away from them if you homeschool. These folks are Christians, it's part of their Christian convictions to homeschool. Came here for political asylum, our immigration agency gave them political asylum, and then Eric Holder got involved. So the Department of Justice is now suing. Uh, they, well I don't know if it's correct to say they're suing. They got involved to revoke that political asylum, so Homeschool Legal Defense Agency, Homeschool Legal Defense Association, HSLDA, uh, is suing the Department of Justice in uh, circuit court to keep this family from being sent away from our country of freedom where they came to be free back to Germany where they would lose their family. So. I would encourage you to go to the website for HSLDA, and I believe it's just www.hslda.org, and you'll find more information on that. If we can find out what you can do about it, there's somebody to call, write, um, email, whatever, we will get that to you via email. Keep an eye on that. Okay, we are all very concerned about our Second Amendment rights and the protection of those against the federal government. Um, we just wanted to update that, update you on that quickly. The, a, quite a large group of our members went down to the Indian Valley Library a couple Saturdays ago to speak with uh, Mike Fitzpatrick's representative. I believe there were 22 people there, um, many of them from our group. And the representative who was there, uh, it's actually Jenny McClure, we have Sheriff Duke Donnelly with us, and Jenny is his right-hand lady. Um, but Jenny's not a, a staffer in his regular office, like his Langhorne office, so she wasn't really able to 
answer questions or deal with issues, but she did promise to get back to our folks, and we will. We are waiting to hear from uh, Representative Fitzpatrick because there are concerns about his position. So you might want to um, check with Bob Frank. Okay, and Bob McLean, if you two gentlemen just raise your hands. If you're interested in pursuing this, you might want to see one of these two gentlemen. Uh, at the state level, you all may have heard of um, House Bill 357. Um, easy to remember, right? That uh, particular bill, I have a copy of that. If you'd like to read it, um, we will leave it at the front table here so you can take a look at it. I was actually in Harrisburg myself. I took the opportunity to um, go visit Representative Quinn and State Representative Kathy Watson. Uh, neither of whom have co-sponsored this bill, and I will only say that if you are living in their district, I would strongly urge you to um, encourage them along the lines of protecting your Second Amendment rights. Um, Kathy Watson has a problem with the author of the bill. That was, that was what she told me. I um, don't know what that says about her convictions about what the bill says. and. Uh, State Representative Quinn said that she was she was looking into the constitutionality of it. So if she's sincerely pursuing that, that's great. We want to make sure it's constitutional. But I would just check back with her and make sure we get an answer, you know, as far as whether she is going to support that or not. If you do not live, uh, by the way, if you're in Paul Clymer's area, you may know, already know he has co-sponsored the bill already with 70 of his colleagues in the uh, state house there. If you are in a different uh, legislative district than those three and would like to know if your uh, state rep has sponsored or co-sponsored that bill, I will have that information up here as well. You can take a look at it. There is a petition on the back table. Uh, make sure, how many of you um, signed that petition coming in to support Rep Representative Daryl Metcalf's bill 357? Can we pass that around, ladies? Okay, well, there's two different petitions. The one I'm talking about is Daryl Metcalf. Okay, let's put that on a clipboard, Vicki. I think they probably got a clipboard at the back, or I have one. We'll pass that around. You can sign that as we move along here. Okay, and Carlo Rilletto, um, just tell us when your rally is with the concerned gun owners of Bucks County. Well, we're, we're having we're having a meeting next Tuesday at the Veterans of Foreign War in Warminster. Uh, that's good that you're passing that around. I have more copies here. We also have, and, and by the way, that would be the first step. If we can pass a law in Pennsylvania and actually take the pressure of the sheriffs and everybody too, this is basically says it's illegal for the federal government to come in. But we also have a petition here that I think we passed on last time, basically asking the sheriffs to take action in case the Fed, the Fed do pass the law and they decide to do confiscation or registration. In addition to that, I have a petition here that I'd like to pass around, and basically what it is is an open letter to the government telling them that we want safety in schools. We want safety in schools by providing real protection. I, I just heard, I think, Biden, as I, as I drove in on the radio, saying, well, we don't need as more guns in school. I mean, these are, that's almost as absurd as shooting a shotgun off your balcony. But, 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 but the, um, uh, Says the <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, Try it, by the way. Let me know how fast the police come then. <laughs> so, so I'd like to pass these around, and I don't want to take your time doing it. And that's, that's about it. Also, April 23rd. April 23rd, we're, we're making arrangements to have a bus to go down to Harrisburg, and basically we'll be supporting basically 357, and here's an opportunity to knock on all of your representatives' door, right face to face, right at their office there, and, uh, and basically tell them, hey, uh, what's going on here? And by the way, looking at the... It's on the event sheet. Yeah, that's on the event sheet. Information on that is on that event sheet. But there will be a local bus. Uh, the chair of the committee is that a problem with supremacy clause. Uh, 
Uh, the Metcalf office has been pulled already today. They say you need to flood all these people that are on this, this committee, as well as your representatives. So please pick it up. They're all here. The phone numbers are here. Pick one up on the way out. You have it handy. Make your calls if you haven't already. Yeah, and folks, uh, that's very important because th this is stuck in the Judiciary Committee until this chairman who is who is not uh, forthcoming with his support. Uh, I believe his name is Marsico. Um, so calling is very critical. Now, I have up here a list of the, the uh, Judiciary Committee by their uh, party, whether they're Democrat or Republican, because I think who we want to pressure are the Republicans. I mean, that's that's hopefully a better bang for your buck. Um, I have that information here. I believe the list that Kathy has um, lists a Democrat first and then the Republicans are listed. Some are already co-sponsors and that's also indicated up here. So if you would just like a little more information as to whether they're a co-sponsor or whether they really need a call because they aren't on board, you can take a look at that afterward. Let me just read you uh, just the, the quick um, summary of this bill. It says it's called the Right to Bear Arms Protection Act. This is 357, providing that any federal law which attempts to register, restrict, or ban a firearm, or to limit the size of a magazine of a firearm in this commonwealth shall be unenforceable in this commonwealth and imposing penalties. And you can come up here and read what the penalties are. It, it uh, includes, um, considering any federal agent who comes and tries to enforce any federal regulation uh, as committing a felony of the third degree. So it has teeth in it. You might want to take a look at that. Okay, um, I think that's enough for introduction. I'm sorry it takes so long with that, but these things are important. We are uh, honored tonight to have three men with us who will be uh, speaking to you about the role of the sheriff. Uh, we have our sheriff in Bucks County, Duke Donnelly. He will be um, speaking from his perspective as an acting sheriff and his experience. Tom Ligenfelter, who is a candidate for sheriff's office in Bucks County. But our keynote speaker tonight is William Taylor Ryle. Bill Ryle um, is one of the, the veterans of the constitutional movement that, that I greatly um, admire and appreciate because when most of us were all asleep, Bill Ryle was banging on doors in Harrisburg and uh, trying to wake up the, our legislators about <coughs> adhering to the Constitution. So we thank you for that, Mr. Ryle. Um, let me just give you a quick uh, bio for Bill. Uh, since 1990, he has been intently studying and research, researching constitutional law, particularly Pennsylvania history and law. During this time period, Mr. Ryle, though not an attorney, has staunchly defended the individual rights of himself and helped others in Pennsylvania do the same, and has passionately defended the Pennsylvania Constitution through litigation, the education of others, writings, and lawful activism. In 1994, he helped establish the Pennsylvania Committee of Correspondence to educate and network Pennsylvanians together in an effort to actively reclaim our rights. He has also been an active member in a long list of grassroots um, organizations, patriot organizations, and we count him as a member of our group as well because he has, um, he has attended a number of our meetings as well. In 2009, Mr. Rao was one of three Pennsylvania delegates to the Continental Congress 09 and created the County Sheriff Brigades of Pennsylvania. Mr. Rao is currently one of the two state co-coordinators of the County Sheriff Brigades of Pennsylvania writes a weekly article and column for the Time News in Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. And since January 31st of last year, has written and helped hand deliver one or two pages of documents for the County Sheriff Brigades to the Harrisburg offices of the Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Governor, and each state senator and representative approximately every two weeks. That's a lot of walking if you've ever been at the Capitol, if you go to every one of those offices. so. Thank you very much, Bill, for your staunch advocacy for the Constitution and our, our rights under it. And please come give us your thoughts. Thank you, Jamie. It 
It's uh, a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I can probably talk without that, but we'll use the, the, uh, the microphone. As Jane indicated, uh, I had the pleasure of being involved in a, uh, a lot of activities over the years. Um, some not so pleasure, but, but uh, nevertheless, uh, you learn from everything, and I am so pleased that more and more people are waking up, and I'm hearing the word constitution much more frequently. Can you talk about the perfect name for a group, Citizens for Constitutional Government? Um, I'm sure most of you realize we don't have such a thing, either the local, state, or federal. Um, so we have our work cut out for us, for us, and it is so important that the sheriff in each county understand and execute his or her duties according to the law. And so what I try to do is help people understand that the law really is the remedy. We don't have to make this up. The framers got it right most of the time. Unfortunately, intensely since the war between the states, our governments have gone away from the Constitution. So I want to share a little bit about the Pennsylvania Constitution and its uh, authority, and then get into the sheriff. Before I do that, I guess I ought to do a little plug. Um, the County Sheriff Brigades of Pennsylvania is an organization that tries to network together the brigades in each county. There is a brigade here in Bucks County. Uh, Bob Frank is the, uh, the head of that. And uh, we would encourage everybody to get involved with it, uh, working in conjunction with other grassroots. It's not intended to replace, but to provide a learning uh, location. Of course, the website, uh, which Jamie indicated, uh, does provide uh, good information. But also to work with the sheriff, not as part of his office, but to work with and instruct the sheriff as to what his or her duties are and be available for help if need be. I fear greatly that uh, chaos is going to be uh, amongst us, uh, maybe in the near future. So we need to get prepared. Anyway, on the table, uh, <coughs> there's a copy of the state constitution. It's the House version. The, the Senate has a different version. <laughs> so, isn't it, this is our uh, efficiency <coughs> of the government, right? <coughs> Anyway, I like the Senate version because, first of all, it's got bigger print, and that's good for me and you know, other older folks. Uh, also, it only contains the Constitution. The House version has all sorts of other things that aren't part of the Constitution. But unfortunately, the Senate doesn't like to give theirs out very much anymore. I suspect you can get one yourself, but I can't get them in volume. Uh, so the House version will have to make do with. I would really encourage you to get a copy and read at least the first seven pages. That's the Declaration of Rights. That's what really pertains to us. And it's a prohib prohibition, by and large, on government what they can't do, just like the Bill of Rights. Um, you may recall that in 1776, uh, the colonists decided they wanted to break away from England. Uh, they started a war and uh, declared their independence, right? And the people who were in that uh, convention went back to their states and wrote state constitutions. The Pennsylvania Constitution was signed into law by Benjamin Franklin on September 28, 1776. It's an excellent document. And then uh, they rocked along trying to finish up the war and had a treaty of peace. Uh, in 1783 and got together in Philadelphia and wrote the federal constitution and that went out to the states and it was ratified actually on June 21st, 1788, maybe a date that you're not familiar with. It was sent out on September 17th, 17, uh, 1787. And we celebrate that as Constitution Day and I don't really have a problem with that, a couple of reasons. First of all, when it went out, it was a uh, tremendous document but that's all it was. It wasn't law. It didn't become law until June 21st, 1788, when New Hampshire was the ninth uh, state to, to ratify. At any rate, it went into force on March the 4th, 
1789, and uh, there had been over 200 complaints about deficiencies in the Constitution during the ratification process, and uh, those got boiled down to 12. Madison sent them out, and the last 10 were ratified uh, on December 15, 1791, and they became the Bill of Rights. And they were put in the Constitution because the people of the states were extremely concerned about the central government and this tyranny it may become. They were just finished fighting a war from England, didn't they? So can you imagine that they would really think that a central government was what they wanted? Of course not. The Constitution is a enumerated, limited enumerated powers. And unfortunately today, most attorneys and judges and those in government don't even read the document, much less understand it. In fact, as I've been doing this, I've asked people, have they read the state constitution and the federal constitution? More have read the federal than the state. But as far as the state is concerned, between 90 and 95% of the people that I ask say no. Now, maybe because I preface by saying I've been studying it for a long time and they might be afraid of the next question, it would be embarrassing. But nevertheless, I would encourage you to do the same thing. Get to know at least the Declaration of Rights. Very, very powerful. And I want to touch on a couple, and then I want to jump into the sheriff's duties and responsibilities. First of all, as you indicated, uh, God is ever-present here. And it's confirmed by the Constitution. The preamble in the Pennsylvania Constitution which, by the way, the 46 states that have the same preamble, the other four have very similar ones. We, the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, grateful to Almighty God for the blessings of civil and religious liberty and humbly invoking his guidance, do ordain and establish this Constitution. Now, the 1776 Constitution is similar, and it has the same sentiment. I'll refer to that in just a minute. But then follows the Declaration of Rights. And the introduction of that says that the general, great, and essential principles of liberty and free government may be recognized and unalterably established. We declare that, and then it proceeds to uh, enumerate the Declaration of Rights. Now, we heard about the gun uh, control that the federal government wants to impose, and I want to try to give you ammunition so you can answer those no matter who they are and tell them they got no authority to do what they're trying to do. I would challenge anybody, and I'm glad that someone brought state, I mean federal constitutions, uh, and I would encourage you to pick this up from them, but I would challenge anybody to find in the federal constitution where the federal government has an enumerated powers to discuss guns. Oh, wait a minute. There's the Commerce Clause, right? That's always, they always use that. Well, I have an article on the uh, website that talks about the true meaning of the Commerce Clause and how it's been perverted. Provisions in the federal constitution were put there by the people of the states in convention, right, in Philadelphia, in order to prohibit wrongdoing by the government and to encourage freedom and liberty. The Commerce Clause was put in the Constitution because the states had a tendency to put on tariffs and taxes when, when products would go through the state. And if you read the Federalist Papers on this subject, they talked about it extensively. They wanted to eliminate the possibility of this tension, this com competing effort between the states, which ultimately would lead to war. That's their words, not mine. It's Madison. And the reason for the Commerce Clause was to keep things regular, to encourage commerce between the states. And that's been turned upside down by certain attorneys and judges, and actually it's the National Commissioners of Uniform State Laws that led this effort starting in 1891. And that's a subject for another day. But the point being is, the Commerce Clause is a sham when they use it that way. They absolutely perverted the meaning of it. And then there's a necessary and proper clause, right? That implements the provisions, the other 17, in Article 1, Section 8. And that's an excuse that attorneys will use. Well, it's necessary problem. Well, if 
you have no authority to start with, you don't have to worry about necessary and proper, do you? All right? So, uh, oh, by the way, in the 13th Amendment, they changed that appropriate legislation as the implementing clause. What makes it appropriate? Who determines that, right? So you see how the Constitution has been perverted over time. So the federal government, I don't believe, can or anyone can produce any authority for the federal government to do anything with respect to bearing arms. But let's talk about who's really in charge. Article 1, Section 1 of the Pennsylvania Constitution, that's the Declaration of Rights. It's the first thing. It says all men are born equally free and independent and have certain inherent and indefeasible rights, among which are those of enjoying and defending life, liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property and reputation, and pursuing their own happiness. That's a very important section for a lot of reasons. When you purchase a gun, isn't that property? And this provision says you have the right to acquire something, to possess it, which means to use and dispose of it at your will, and to uh, protect it. Article 1, Section 2 is titled Political Powers, and it says all power is inherent in the people. And all free governments are founded on their authority and instituted for their peace, safety, and happiness. For the advancement of these ends, they have at all times the inalienable and defeasible right to alter, reform, or abolish their government as they sit, uh, such in, in such manner as they may see think proper. Who's the boss here? I guess is the question. Anybody know the answer to that question? The people. Unique on the earth, in America, and in every state, we are the sovereigns, not the state, not the federal government. We have given them our authority to act on our behalf according to the Constitution. And if some statute or some rule or some regulation or some action by anybody in government is contrary to those two doctrines, that is the state constitution and where applicable the federal constitution, their actions are totally null and void from the time that they did it. Everybody remember that or you, you understand that? Well, let's, I don't like necessarily quote the courts, but let's do that. Page seven of this, it's actually the Citizens Group book, has a number of cases. Pretty much everybody knows Marbury versus Madison, right? 1803, you've heard of that case? And Justice Marshall, in that opinion, toward the end, says, all laws which are repugnant to the Constitution are null and void. The court must be right, right? Not necessarily. <laughs> in fact, the meaning of Marbury versus Madison has been so distorted by attorneys and judges it's hardly recognizable. But anyway, I know everybody who's ever been stopped by a police officer knows this one. Uh, Miranda versus Arizona, 1963 uh, case. 66, excuse me. It says, where rights secured by the Constitution are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation which would abrogate them. So it's saying that Everybody in government has to operate according to the constitutions, and if they do anything that's contrary to it, it's null and void from the time they do it. In fact, the general rule that's quoted here says the general rule is that an unconstitutional statute, though having the form and name of law, is in reality no law, but wholly void and ineffective for any purpose, since unconstitutionality dates from the time of its enactment and not merely from the date of the decision so branding it, no one is bound to obey an unconstitutional law, and no courts are bound to enforce it. Now, unfortunately, our courts don't read this stuff <laughs> because they're doing all sorts of things that are unconstitutional, and they usually say, well, that's a federal issue. We can't do anything. I hear this in Harrisburg constantly. Well, no, that's not true. And they need to understand from us that it's not true. And in fact, there are all sorts of decisions that confirm what I just said. The question then becomes, who determines what is unconstitutional or what is constitutional? Now, the courts will tell you 
only the courts and ultimately the Supreme Court, right? You've heard that? Wrong. All right, if that's the case, we only have one branch of government. It's the judiciary, and the Supreme Court's running the whole show. Everybody yields to the judiciary. I don't think the oath of office that's in the Constitution says that. When you get a chance, read it. Article 6, Section 3 of the Pennsylvania Constitution says, I, whoever it is, do solemnly swear or affirm to support, obey, and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of this Commonwealth, and to discharge the duties of my office with fidelity. Period. I didn't hear anything about statutes or courts or other politicians <coughs> or anything. Did you? They don't read it. So how in the world are they going to support, obey, and defend it? There's the first task we ought to be doing, is insisting that everybody that runs for government and that is in government reads the document and understands its original intent and acts strictly according to it, right? Would that be a good objective? The only job in the world is working for government where you don't have to know your job description. That's what the Constitution is. It tells them what they can do and what they can't do. And we got a whole bunch of people making alleged laws, which by the way, most of them are either unconstitutional or they don't apply to you as humans because you're protected by the Declaration of Rights. And if something is contrary to the Declaration of Rights, what happens to that law? Gone from the time that they did. So the answer to the question is you and I are the sovereigns. Who can ultimately decide what is unconstitutional? Being responsible for your decision, sometimes you might be wrong, put you in jail, you might end up there anyway, but the, necessary, the, the necessity for us, the people, to get hold of this Constitution, the state Constitution and the federal Constitution, Constitution is paramount. We do all sorts of things fighting bills that really are null and void. Either they're unconstitutional or they don't apply to the people. They might apply to a corporation, totally different, fictitious entity, not humans. Corporations don't have rights, by the way, neither do trees, dogs, and everything else. Only humans. Now, I realize I might offend some uh, dog lovers. I love dogs too, all right? But they're animals. They don't have rights. We do. Given to us by God. Confirmed in the, the Constitution, right in the preamble, right? Don't have to make it up. It's there. Wouldn't it be great if somebody raises this question, well, we can't talk about God? You say, hmm, let me read the preamble to the state constitution. End of story. All right? See the power of the law? We just got to use it. Well, there's all sorts of things I could talk about, but we'll, uh, we won't have time. Let's talk about the relationship a little bit about between the states and the federal government. Actually, we don't have a federal government now. We have a national government at best, but the way it's supposed to be. First of all, the states came first, right? The first 13 states were states before the federal government came into existence. Pennsylvania was created on September 28, 1776. And the convention for writing the federal constitution was where? Philadelphia. All right? So, pretty prominent state. In fact, one of the very few states that weren't charters by English government. Pennsylvania was a creation of a land grant given to William Penn in, his, in payment to debt that the king owned uh, William Penn's father. So this state is unique, and it was a holy experiment, right? Remember, remember that? Mm -hmm. A place where people could come for religious and civil liberty. <laughs> Well, the conventions of the states, the citizens in the states, created the federal government, didn't they? They, in fact, voted on it to create it. And in Madison's 51, Federalist 51, Madison talks about this relationship between the federal government and the state government. Let me read it to you. In a single republic, all the power surrendered by the people is uh, submitted to the administration of a single government. And usurpations are guarded against by a division of the government into distinct and separate departments. In a compound republic, in the compound republic of America, 
The power surrendered by the people is first divided between two distinct governments, state and federal, and then the portions allotted to each subdivision among distinct and separate departments. Hence, a double security arises to the rights of the people. The different governments will control each other, and at the same time, each will control, be controlled by itself. So when somebody says nullification isn't valid and we don't have time to talk about that, they're wrong. I just read Madison, who's the father of the Constitution, explaining this different spheres of authority, state and federal. And because the states created the federal government, who's superior in this arrangement? The creator is always, always superior to the creation. God is superior to us so forth. So, the argument is sound and based on law. Now, there's three kinds of nullification. There's individual nullification. Can't you say no? And we ought to be saying no a lot. Now you got to do it in the right way, all right? And with knowledge. And then there's the county nullification where the jury nullifies things. The sheriff says no. The federal government's not coming in here and bothering us. That's nullification. Darrell Metcalf's law is a nullification law. It says, no matter what the federal government does, we've had enough. We're not going to enforce any more federal laws. They don't have any authority to start any of them. But nevertheless, he's drawn the line in the sand. And there's a penalty, like you said. It's a felony in the third degree. Uh, some people have a problem with being a felony. I don't. I think we've really got to put teeth into things. So we have this relationship between the federal government and the state government where the state is superior and the county is the building block of every state. Chester County has been around, excuse me, I'm not Chester County, sorry, Bucks County. I'm from Chester County, so bring, bring it up, flip there. Bucks County is one of the original states. William Penn came here and established his home in Bucks County, didn't he? came up the river, you know, and uh, established Philadelphia. At any rate, we have a rich history here. And the sheriff, actually the constables and the sheriffs, have been here since the very beginning, since before there was a state. Sheriffs first came into existence around 500 A.D. in England. They are the chief, in today's terms, chief law enforcement officer of the county. Have, has always they've always been that. Think about it. When did the first municipal police come into existence? Late 1800s. Started in New York City. All right. The politicians want to be able to control the, the police, so they started their own. And they've been working at pushing the sheriff out of existence from the from uh, really uh, 1874 in the Constitution. They started pushing, and they've been pushing there ever since. Over in Delaware, they're trying to eliminate the power. In fact, they have, by statute, allegedly eliminated the authority of the sheriff to, to do any investigation and arrest. Probably know about Jeff Christopher. At any rate, there's a march to eliminate the office of sheriff. We can't let that happen. Because the sheriff is elected by us, isn't he? He and the constables are the only peace officers that are elected. Everybody else is appointed. And they work for somebody else. Now, they all took the oath of office, but they ignore it. So we got to make sure that our sheriff understands what his or her duties are and help them do it and be prepared to back them up. And oh, by the way, that's the law. And that's what the County Sheriff Brigades and the Brigades in the, each county is all about to help the sheriff understand and the people understand what the law is and to be ready to help the sheriff keep the peace. Now, attorneys and judges have been working a long time to eliminate that. But it's just not true. Now, the DA, district attorney, thinks that he's the top cop in the county, right? Wrong. How in the world can that be? He is, in fact, the chief prosecutor in the county. He holds the office of attorney at law. 
It's Title 42, Section 2521. He takes an oath, which is a little, it's the same as the regular oath with the more to the courts. He's part of the judicial branch as a attorney at law. Article 5, Section 10C confirms that in the state constitution, that he works for the Supreme Court. How in the world, if there's any such thing as separation of powers, can he be the chief executive officer in the county? Can you explain that to me? He can't. They just don't tell the truth. Oh, well, wait a minute. The attorney general is also the chief law enforcement officer in the, count, in the Commonwealth, right? They snuck that out again in 76, I think, in the Constitution. No, no. The governor is the chief law enforcement officer of the Commonwealth. His primary duty is, according to Article uh, 4, to see that the laws are faithfully executed. Isn't that a law enforcement officer? Can't people read? We have to stand up and say to those in government, read the document and follow it according to the original intent. That's our challenge. So the sheriff has always been and will always be the chief, in today's terms, law enforcement officer of the county. I don't like that term, by the way. They, they changed it. I think he is the chief peace officer, but he is the chief, or she, is the chief executive officer and he has or she has deputies that work for him or her to keep the peace. And they report directly to us. How many of you used to watch Western? I always did. Right. And there's the sheriff, right, standing on the jailhouse and the mob comes to get somebody to lynch him and what does he do? He says, you gotta come through me if you're gonna take this prisoner because he's entitled to due process. Or the bank gets robbed, and what does he do? He calls for everybody in town, grab your gun, get your horse, and we're going after the crooks. He forms the posse. Well, in Pennsylvania, the sheriff has that authority today. He does. In fact, no court decision or legislature can diminish the authority of the sheriff that, that, that the sheriff had in 1776. Yes, sir? Uh, will you take a question? I will in when I'm finished, if you don't mind, okay? And do by means, by all means, ask questions. Now, that doesn't mean that that's what the government today thinks or what they do. I would like everybody to remember that we have what it is today and what it's supposed to be, and they're not the same. What I'm telling you is the law and the way it's supposed to be and in my opinion the way we got to get it back if you're going to have a constitutional government if you don't all bets are off they can do pretty much whatever they want right they think they can but the remedy the remedy is for the people to know the law and to insist that those in government follow it so where do i come up with all this stuff that the sheriff is the chief law enforcement officer of the county and he can't, his duties cannot be diminished except by a constitutional amendment. That's the only way, because the sheriff works for us. And we have to speak, and the way we speak is through constitutional amendments. And I don't know of any constitutional amendment that has diminished any powers of the sheriff. Now the legislature, not the courts by the way, but the legislature can increase the duties and responsibilities of the sheriff, but they cannot diminish them. And there were no law enforcement officers up until the late 1800s in this country. So we must have had some way of stopping crooks before that. And they had investigative powers, and they ran the jails and the prisons. What happened to all that? They've been working aggressively since 1874 to eliminate the sheriffs. Before that, the sheriff and the coroner used to have their own section in the Constitution. In 1784, they put them as the head of the county officers. And in the last uh, alleged constitutional change, the coroner got dropped from the list and the sheriff got put down in the list of, uh, of all the others, after the DA, by the way. Because these changes have been driven by attorneys, not by the people. And I have this well documented. So, if the sheriff is the chief law enforcement officer and he's been lied to by the DA and the judges and everybody else, that all they got to do is serve uh, you know, evictions and uh, make sure there's a deputy in each courtroom and transport prisoners and they can be on the board of the prisons but they can't run it anymore. 
what has happened to our elected sheriff? They've been neutered. Wrong. The law says you can't do that. And if you'd like to read it, you can read these two volumes. It's called Anderson on Sheriffs, written in 1941, and it's pretty much uh, acknowledged as the current authority. There are previous authorities that talk about the same thing. And when I showed Sheriff Welch, who's the sheriff in Chester County, these books, she said, boy, there's a lot of little print in here. And she's right, all right? Now, sheriffs, figure me out here, they don't really necessarily want to spend a lot of time reading a lot of little print. But these books are the definitive source of information for sheriffs, constables, and coroners. Now, how many of you know that the coroner is equal to the sheriff? Yeah. The coroner can take the place of the sheriff when the sheriff's not present. The coroner is the only one that can serve papers on the sheriff. Correct, Sheriff? All right. In this common law, in Pennsylvania, the common law is clear. And no matter what the crooked attorneys and politicians try to do and the courts, they can't change this. Not lawfully, because we didn't give them authority to do it. Now, it's a matter of standing up. So do you want to read all these two volumes? Probably not. I have, and I offer to teach sheriffs and deputy sheriffs what's in them. Um, but I've tried to summarize these in the article which is back there. The sheriff is the chief law enforcement officer, quote unquote, in the county. Get a copy of it, please. Read the excerpts that confirm that the sheriff is the chief law enforcement officer, that his duties cannot be diminished but only can be increased. Here it is, black and white. Now there's another article back there that goes right to what the sheriff is supposed to be doing and what we're here about tonight. And that's this gun control grab that's going on. Tragic as Sandy Hook was, and others of no uh, gun-free zones. Uh, guns are not the cause. And that's the title of the document that's back there, Guns Are Not the Cause. And I tried to lay out the argument as to uh, that. I have a friend who has a sticker on his van that says, if, if uh, guns kill people, then pencils misspell words. <laughs> guns don't kill people, people kill people. I list 12 things that I do believe contribute to what's going on. The first one is taking God out of public square. We have lost our moral compass here. Not all. The second one is gun free zone. What nutty idea is that? That's an invitation to somebody who wants to go have a killing field. Now, in Texas, they've implemented in one school district particularly, where um, the teachers or the administrators or the janitors can volunteer to carry, conceal. They use fractional bullets, means if it hits something solid, it'll uh, disintegrate, so it won't ricochet. They are trained, certified, approved by the Board of Education, but not disclosed as to who's caring or how many. They have the normal security in the school and cameras and all that stuff, but think about it. If the administrator and the other people in the office had met Adam uh, Lanza with arms, how many people do you think would have been killed? Probably not any. That's the reality. Most of the time, when somebody who's a little deranged, and I think he was a lot deranged, um, is confronted with the guns, they give up. Because they're basically cowards. But if there's nobody facing them down, they're gonna do whatever they're gonna do. Now that's not a given, but I would suggest in all of these cases, the amount of injury and murder would have been minimized, and has. There are many, many cases where guns prevent harm, more so than not. Third one is attorneys, and judges, and justices, and professors of law and politicians, they have contributed to this problem. Uh, you can read it, the media, uh, drugs, both legal and illegal, divorce, uh, psychologists, 
you think, you know, oh my goodness, we can't tell Johnny he's walking down a step. He might be reward for life. We need to start getting back to the basics. And the basics is for the sheriff to start acting like a sheriff. We need to require them to do it because the sheriff also has the power here in Pennsylvania to deputize every able body, actually 15 males, 15 to 45, what it used to be. I say every able body person, but I for one know that a lot of women shoot better than men do. My ex-wife was one of them. <laughs> because I learned very quickly. Well, she's the daughter of a chief of police and an ex-marine, so you can figure that out. Anyway, the point being is I didn't know that. I learned it very quickly after we were married. But the point being is, today, we need to be ready to protect our own rights, don't we? And the sheriff here has the lawful authority to form a posse. Now the militias, and some people don't like to talk about this, militias are us. And you can form in, uh, in uh, militias locally and statewide. The militias fall under the, the uh, authority of the government when formed, all right? But the people have to get in their heads that we're the bosses and we need to instruct those who work for us to do their job. And one of the jobs is the sheriff is elected to stand between us and government. Isn't he? Or a mob, or whatever. The term that um, was used by Madison in his Federal Papers in 1798 was interpose. He needs to interpose himself between you and who's trying to get you. Be it the, someone trying to come after you, the county, the state, or the federal government. That's the sheriff's job. Oh, by the way, it's the job of everybody in government. They all take the same oath, don't they? Why do we keep paying them when they don't do their job? Why do we keep re-electing them when they don't do their job? Pardon me? So because if you don't pay them, you go to jail. Okay. Now, here's the choice. All right? You can sit there and say that, and you might. All right? And I appreciate your sentiments. But I tell you what, if you do nothing, if you do nothing, if you let them continue to do what they're doing, you're already experienced in the tyranny, aren't you? Are you happy with your government? All right? So now is the time, because you'll never be stronger than you are today. Learn, stand together, and instruct those who work for us to do their job. If we don't do that, all this stuff is a waste of time. Now that might be a little harsh, but think about it. You come out to meetings, you learn a whole lot of stuff, and then you go home and you say, gee, I guess I won't do anything. All right? We've got to stand up and instruct those who work for us. That means go to those who you are elected and have a serious conversation. Don't put them on a pedestal. They're your public servant. Be respectful, but understand you're the boss. I used to be in corporate world. I know how to be a boss. You take care of the people you work for as long as they do their job, and if they don't, what do you do with them? You fire them. Well, there's all sorts of other remedies. But the point being is, we are so controlled by government and thinking that we have to do what they tell us to do that we're no longer free. Benjamin Franklin said what? Those who would give up a little liberty or liberty for a little temporary security deserve neither liberty or security. It's in fact carved on the wall to the left as you go up the steps from the Capitol. In fact, years ago, I used to ask the people in Harrisburg to park their car on 3rd Street and walk up those steps and read all that stuff. Go around the rotunda, read all that. Go to the House, go to the Senate, go up to the Supreme Court. What a great place to go visit. Have you, have, have you all been to the Supreme Court in Harrisburg? If you haven't, that's worth a trip. The murals in that room really are instructive. The Ten Commandments are behind the bench. Beatitudes to the, to the left of the judge, to, the, to your right if you're facing it. Blackstone's commentaries, the rule of the uh, divine law. It's all there. Always have been there since 1906. And they have court in that room, and they'll find you guilty if you are so 
just so brazen to me to uh, mention Jesus Christ. Anyway, we have uh, Daryl Medcast's bill. Jamie uh, mentioned that. There's also uh, a, uh, the uh, Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace, and Peace Officers Association. How many are familiar with that? Richard, uh, Sheriff Richard Mack started it. And uh, he's put out on the website for sheriffs to sign up and make a pledge that they will defend the citizens against invasion by the federal government in violation of the Second Amendment. And by the way, you don't have any Second Amendment rights. That's a, it's a nice little thing. They do these little clever words. You have rights, and they're protected, guaranteed, secured by the, the Second Amendment in the federal arena. The Declaration of Rights secures your rights in the state jurisdictions. They're your rights. They can't take them away. They might make it so you can't use them, but they can't take them away. Anyway, Sheriff Mack has got uh, people signing up, sheriffs and peace officers um, and other governed uh, county officers. There are now 14 sheriff's associations who have signed up as, as, as of today, and 349 uh, sheriffs. We have um, 12 here in Pennsylvania, and I would encourage, if you're not in, a, in, if your sheriff is not signed up, that you do so. We need to make a statement to the entire country that enough's enough. That the sheriffs are going to stand according to the law, and that we're going to support the sheriff as long as they do. And if they don't, we need to replace them. And that may be a little harsh to the current sheriff. But it is, in fact, what we need to do. And I've never been shy about trying to tell the truth here. If you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to stand up, if you're willing to go along to get along, you're going to lose. And I suggest to you that the people in Philadelphia, when the economy goes down, are going to be in Bucks County big time. And you're going to need a strong sheriff, and you're going to need to be organized, because they're coming to get your food. And if you don't understand that, that the economy is going down unless we can stop this runaway train. There's going to be a lot of unrest. Now, are you willing to do it? That's the question. You can come to meetings, and that's all well and good. Anyway, um, I guess I'll just close by quoting Edmund Burke. The only thing necessary for evil to uh, succeed is for good men to do nothing. Now, you have a question. Yeah, when you, it was interesting when you mentioned about the, the sheriff and uh, for want of a better term, deputizing people that he would need. Is, does he select them? Does he ask for volunteers? And once he has them, what are the, what are the ramifications legally for them? If they happen to do something, you know. The way it is and the way it's supposed to be. Keep this in mind. All right? You got a government that thinks they're omnipotent. And if you worry about judges and attorneys, you lose. My suggestion to sheriffs is they are the chief law enforcement officer in the county. They need to start acting like it and doing it. And don't take it from the DA and anybody else when they tell him not to. The people need to support that effort if he does. The DA will push back. As I suggested to Sheriff Welch, uh, if you cite someone for violation of the law and you take that individual into custody and you present that bill to the, the uh, DA, it's his duty or her duty to prosecute. You have made the assessment that the law has been broken. That's the job of the executive branch, to enforce the law. The judicial branch prosecutes people, right? Now they say, well, we've got all sorts of discretion. No. Somebody breaks the law, they need to be tried by a jury. You can judge the law and the facts. That's the law here in Pennsylvania. So the answer is when the DA just says, well, I'm not going to prosecute. Wait a minute. They took an oath of office to the Constitution, and someone's broken the law, and he's not going to do his job. What's the remedy, folks? The 
sheriff has the authority to do what? To give him a place to stay for a while. All right? Now, I don't think it would come to that. As long as the sheriff starts acting like a sheriff, and we the people say to everybody that's in county government, the sheriff is the boss here, and as long as he does his job, we're with him. If he's not, he's out. He's not the king. Who's the king? We are. No, he thinks he is. He's said Obama. He thinks he is. No, we are. Michael Bagdaris, who's a Texan, who was the president of the Continental Congress, wrote a book, Good to be King. Uh, read it. It's a good constitutional course. At any rate, so then uh, she says, well, even if I did that, the judge wouldn't hear the case. So I'm just, you know, dumb old guy, right? I said, okay, bunny, I'm sure you can figure this out. All right, you've got a deputy sheriff in every courtroom. And if the deputy sees the judge violating the law, the rights of the people, what's the deputy's duty? Have a little discussion with the judge. And say, judge, I just saw you break the law. I really would like for you to correct that mistake because I don't want to arrest you for breaking the law. Wouldn't it be great if people would do their job? All right? In fact, I had a young deputy in a, I was in court, and the judge violated my rights, and afterwards I said to the young deputy, I said, you stood here and saw him break the law and violate my rights, and you did nothing. You should have arrested him. The young kid was bright. Just, they don't pay me enough to do that. <laughs> my answer was, well, if you would do your job, maybe the people of this county would see fit to give you a raise. The point being is,